Hi there. My name is uh, Michel Brekkemans. I'm Managing Director with SCP Asia. Uh, SCP Asia is a consulting firm based in Singapore. Uh, we help clients in the healthcare and life science space, working with pharmaceutical companies, medtech companies, uh, healthcare service providers, as well as digital health companies. Uh, today's presentation is going to be on telehealth in Asia Pacific region. Um, I'll be sharing some background on what's going on in the Asia Pacific landscape. Uh, we'll be doing a couple of case studies and then also we'll be sharing some examples of leading companies in the region. Hope you enjoy the presentation. So let's start by taking a look at the Asia Pacific healthcare landscape and some key numbers here to start off with. Uh, first of all, the region's developing healthcare landscape will represent more than 40% of growth in global healthcare spending over the next decade. Uh, it's expanding at a rate that's almost double compared to the rest of the world. Also, aging populations and widespread chronic illnesses will necessitate a change in the model of care in the region. Uh, there will be close to half a billion of people aged 65 years and older by 2025. Also, healthcare investment is expected to continue to grow faster than in other regions. Uh, the latest year that I have figured for is 2018 saw uh, investments of about 16 billion US dollars in healthcare private equity by our deal, deal value. So that's kind of excluding uh, VC investment and angel investment. And this has sort of grown at 38% between 2013 and 2018 compared to only 29% for the rest of the world. So sort of outpacing growth in that dimension as well. Next up, uh, physicians and consumers are kind of ready to uh, look at different kind of models of healthcare delivery. Um, they're kind of pushing frontline for delivery and demanding more control with nearly 70% of patients preferring kind of single touch points for managing their healthcare. Uh, physicians are feeling increasingly kind of strained uh, on the healthcare systems. Um, almost half of physicians surveyed are saying it's sort of increasingly difficult to deliver high quality care uh, to their patients. And then um, physicians and consumers both are kind of ready to embrace change. About 50% say they would adopt digital delivery models like telemedicine, telecare, and remote care in the next five years. And this was sort of a survey done prior to the current pandemic. So uh, we expect to see these numbers have accelerated quite substantially since then. So looking at um, you know, the region, then we think that there are very good opportunities for stakeholders across the value chain to kind of transform the healthcare landscape and kind of take advantage of the opportunities that are presenting themselves. So we've kind of identified a number of factors that are driving change in the region. Um, the first one, uh, some, something that we just touched upon earlier is around kind of the changing demographics. So populations across the region are getting older and sicker. Uh, by 2025, there'll be close to half a billion individuals that are over 65 years old, as I mentioned before. Um, the growth in this age category represents about 60% of global growth compared to roughly 20% in Europe and the Middle East and less than 20% for the Americas, about 18%. So at the same time, uh, we're seeing, you know, kind of substantial increases in people with chronic diseases. So over the next uh, five years or so, we expect to see 265 million people diagnosed with diabetes and another 250 million or so over the age of 18 that are expected to be obese. So all these factors will necessitate a shift from acute care services to more chronic care management. 
Second factor is around rising costs. So healthcare costs are rising faster than wages. Um, we see spikes in countries like Australia and Singapore at about 3.3 and 7.8 times respectively. So across the board, 57% uh, of consumers find their out-of-pocket medical bills to be unaffordable and 42% find private insurance premiums to be out of control. And so their concerns are also shared by physicians across all the countries in the region. So a third factor is around kind of the shifting consumer expectations. Uh, a lot of patients are frustrated with the current state of healthcare. Um, a number of frustrations they have. First of all, it's around very long waiting times and rising healthcare costs. At the same time, uh, a new type of consumer is emerging, one who's more interested in overall wellness and more informed about conditions and treatment options than before. So consumers are changing expectations and that will only intensify kind of their dissatisfaction with the current healthcare systems. A fourth factor is around technology innovation. And we see very substantial kind of technological and medical transformations going on right across the region. So Asia Pacific consumers are really embracing kind of the digital area with greater connectivity and very high digital penetration across the region. Uh, so also looking at other sectors, I think you all are familiar with uh, the kind of high kind of digital literacy that exists across the region. So for example, mobile wallet penetration is 65% in China and 60% in India, you know, compared to only 16% in the US and 12% in the UK. So these are very substantial differences in terms of the adoption of digital technologies across different regions. So the rates of digital uptake vary clearly by country. Um, data and analytics are already changing the way healthcare is delivered across the region. And obviously we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. So the fifth kind of factor here is around physician capacity. So a lot of physicians feel they can't keep pace uh, 87% of a recent survey done by Bain believe that they need to be aware of a broader range of treatment protocols than they were before. And 66% find it challenging to keep up with all the various new treatment options that are coming up. And nearly half of the physicians believe that it'd be more difficult to deliver high quality care over the next five years. Uh, due to factors such as a shortfall in funding and resources, rising costs and changing patient expectations. And then the last factor is around the regulatory environment. So regulators are increasingly playing an active role in addressing the excess cost and quality constraints that they're facing in their countries. Uh, the trend is kind of evident, um, but moves towards kind of universal healthcare and markets such as China, Indonesia, and more recently in India and the Philippines. And most regulators are also recognizing that digital solutions will be critical to care delivery, uh, which is shaping policy reform and greater opportunities for greater coordination. So one example we'll look at later is from Singapore where the local government plays a very active role in developing the regulatory environment for new digital services to flourish. Now, before we do that, let's take a quick look at some of that survey data from Bain that I referred to earlier. And kind of in response to a consumer desire for kind of getting access to healthcare, kind of any anytime, anywhere, any place. Um, the various stakeholders in the healthcare sector need to invest in kind of digital tools and online platforms, uh, including telemedicine, um, including respiratories of personal records, uh, on-demand health services, and so on. 
And the survey found that the use of self-diagnosis apps, uh, long-term illness management tools and electronic records is likely to increase significantly over the next couple of years. 46% uh, of the consumer respondents expect to use telemedicine in the next five years. And this is a kind of a doubling compared to what it was before. And again, this survey was done before the pandemic. So I would expect to see these numbers to have gone up quite substantially since then. So despite the high levels of support for telemedicine, many consumers prefer face-to-face -face care. Uh, and with that in mind, I think the stakeholders will need to develop digital and brick and mortar hybrids that integrate both online and offline models. Now looking at um, the kind of physician survey, uh, I think there's another opportunity here to support physicians with new technologies as well. Uh, I think a lot, of a lot of physicians are cognizant of kind of growing disparity between consumer needs on the one hand and their ability to deliver on the other hand. I think they fully expect to see an increase in their use of AI and machine learning over the next five years. And that should help bridge the gap uh, between the expectation from, from the patients and their current ability to deliver. Uh, other uh, advantages such as better clinical decision-making resources and tools uh, is another area where respondents indicate the need for support. Uh, investing in new technologies and AI could really bring uh, shorter uh, delivery capabilities and managing chronic diseases in providing preventative care. Now, as I mentioned, um, you know, COVID-19 has had quite a profound impact on kind of perceptions of and the use of digital health technologies and telehealth in particular. Um, this data here, this chart here is something developed by Health Advances and it shows that China, Singapore and Australia prior to the pandemic were already considered kind of early adopters of telemedicine technologies in the region. Um, these countries were characterized by uh, already quite strong telemedicine platforms and government support. Uh, countries such as Japan and Indonesia were typically uh, a little bit behind the curve. Now come 2020 and with the pandemic, we see sort of a shift of adaptation and kind of embracing of kind of telemedicine technologies across the region with uh, countries like China and Singapore taking a further step forward and places like Japan and Indonesia also moving more towards adopting telehealth and telemedicine models. Just to kind of a few words on Indonesia, it's Southeast Asia's most populous nation. And of course they've been hit quite hard with quite a lot of number of um, COVID-19 cases, uh, quite a high death toll. And media reports have stated that um, there's really been a shortage of protective gear. Uh, there's a shortage of medical practitioners. And, um, you know, there's only actually three doctors for every 10,000 Indonesians. And so also we see quite limited healthcare infrastructure facilities. So, um, you know, it's really put, COVID-19 has really put tremendous pressure on the healthcare system. You know, Indonesia is not unique, clearly we see it across the region and elsewhere in the world. Um, but the government's really directed citizens to telehealth firms through which they can access medical guidance and get consultations via telephone or text, or even have medication prescribed and delivered to them. So because there are limited healthcare facilities, um, you know, the Indonesian people uh, need to get more information that's easy to use without the need to go to a hospital. And so healthcare firms, telehealth firms such as HaloDoc and Allo Doctor have seen usage skyrocket in the recent months. And so it's expected that, you know, in Indonesia, we see very fast growth of telemedicine, you know, after the coronavirus pandemic. So let's 
take a deep dive into some specific areas and specific countries. Now, digital health obviously is very broad, um, and telehealth is kind of a, a subset of the kind of broader digital health category. Uh, typically, I like to think of it into sort of three buckets. So, first of all, you have your remote diagnostics and your remote pathology, which is more of a physician to physician, uh, kind of like a professional service. Uh, then you have your remote kind of patient monitoring, which is a more of a specialist to patient type service. And then you have your telemedicine, which I think obviously gets a lot of media attention these days. It's more of a patient centric solution uh, focused on the kind of interaction between the patient and the physician on the one hand, it could be GPs or specialists but also um, you know, kind of holding patient records, tools for information exchange, and uh, even things like drug delivery. So it's much more of a, a sort of a consumer application uh, so where, where the patient is central. Um, now I'm gonna be doing a deep dive into two markets, uh, China and Singapore, both as, you, as we recall from the previous slide, are considered uh, to be the market leaders in the, in the broader telemedicine space in the region. Uh, it also happens to be the two countries where I've spent the last 20 years living. Um, so I can speak from uh, my own experience, uh, including kind of working with, with clients in these areas. Um, I was originally going to do a deep dive into patient monitoring as well, but uh, you know, we only have an hour. And um, I do think that, however, it is a, a very interesting space particularly because there are a lot of strong U.S. companies with, with good solutions that can think about bringing the products into the Asian market. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, kind of remote cardiac monitoring players, companies like uh, Biotronic or Trice Medical or Cardiolox. Um, you know, there are kind of applications in elderly care, um, you know, companies like Alton View Systems, which monitor kind of senior activities and kind of detect um, you know, issues when, when falls happen, um, things like that. There are sort of players in the maternity uh, space, companies like Baby Scripts, um, you know, and, and actually there's a host of very interesting companies with interesting technologies that would translate quite well in the Asian context. But as I said, you know, we're going to focus just on two applications for this presentation and you know the others uh, will have to do at some other time. So starting with um, China, we, we focus first on the pathology applications, remote pathology applications in China. And to do that, I think it's good to just sort of step back a bit and think about kind of the, the healthcare system that happens to be in China, but actually is quite applicable for many other countries in the region, uh, whether it's India or Indonesia, or most of the other large companies uh, that are still very much in the, the developing stages. Um, so if we look at the Chinese hospital system, you know, it's kind of segmented into different levels based on size and capabilities. Um, you know, grading of hospitals is typically made by local health bureaus. And, um, you know, the grades are basically based on the size and scale and the capabilities, um, which are based on the kind of comprehensiveness of the therapeutic areas covered, the skill level of the physicians, availability of advanced facilities and equipment, teaching capability, et cetera. So normally, um, you know, level three, a, level three hospitals are considered kind of like the, the premier hospitals. Uh, typically, they can also charge a bit more for the services. Um, you know, and typically patients in the, in the largest urban cities tend to visit 3A hospitals, which again are the largest and highest quality hospitals. They would even go there for mild diseases. So. I think it's widely recognized within the population that obviously the best care can be held at those kind of elite kind of hospital institutions. Now, most of the level three and two A hospitals have sort of independent pathology labs, um, 
and if you look at China, the, uh, the hospitals, typically there are multiple labs and departments which are responsible for diagnosis. And, um, you know, you've got the prescribing departments that are prescribing the diagnostic tests directly to the patient. And the pathology labs are mainly responsible for tissue and cellular based diagnosis. Uh, cancer diagnosis is, I would say, probably the primary function of pathology labs. Uh, and nearly every level three hospital has an independent pathology lab, uh, given it's a qualification requirement for you know, being classified as a level three hospital. Now, if you look at level two hospitals, the majority of 2A hospitals have independent pathology labs, but the majority of level 2B and 2C hospitals have no independent pathology lab, uh, given that the labs are typically not profitable and they have very low test volumes and fees. And pathology labs are not present in level 1 hospitals, uh, given that there's really limited to no surgery capabilities in those uh, institutions. So overall, we estimate there are maybe around 5,000 pathology labs in China, and they're primarily in these sort of level three and maybe in some level 2A hospitals. And then we look at the um, resources across the pathology labs, and we can see that they actually vary quite significantly across the different grades of uh, hospital tiers. So pathology labs at level 3A hospitals generally are larger with more resources than the labs at the other hospitals. So the annual budget for sort of the, 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 the better labs might be in the range of 50 to 80K US dollars, uh, and that it would include some of the capital equipment. So pathology labs in level 3B, 3C, and 2A hospitals typically have significantly fewer resources than in the 3A hospitals. So the pathologist and the technician number is very limited in those places. Um, you know, in some cases they might only have one technician to pre prepare slides. And also, um, you know, the pathologists and technicians are often forced to do the slide preparation and test in the same room, uh, which increases the chance of contamination. So budgets are limited and um, yeah, the pathology labs typically have very basic level of infrastructure to help manage the workload. And rarely do they have kind of digitalized analytical tools. So again, those are the lower level hospitals. Um, you know, in 3A hospitals, we do see some moderate to limited incorporation of digital pathology. Uh, primarily, these are basic tools to support the continued manual based processes or for education purposes. Okay, let me just give you a quick description on the pathology process in China. So typically the physician collects the tissue sample and delivers it to the pathology lab for processing and analysis. Um, Consultations are sought by pathologists to support the test results that are complicated or unclear. Uh, a consulting pathologist typically visits the lab that needs the support. So the samples or tissues and the slides do actually not move from side to side. And typically the external kind of pathologist is an expert in a particular specialty or from a higher level institution. And they get uh, typically paid a fee for their service. And once a diagnosis is made, the report is generated. Now, if second opinions on the report are requested, then that's typically because the results are indefinitive or the uh, diagnosis of the disease is not clear. So the patient in that case would borrow the relevant slide from the lab and physically brings the slides to another hospital's pathology lab for analysis. Uh, either the physician or the patient may request a second opinion. And then a new uh, report is generated with the second opinion. And um, yeah, typically it's the 3A hospitals or the higher level hospitals that work as the key providers for second opinions and consultations in you know, more informal hospital pathology networks or the lower level labs. Okay. 
So just to kind of summarize what we've just discussed, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, the pathology labs in China are underdeveloped where the majority of hospitals have access to only very basic resources and external support for second opinions and consultations is provided through kind of informal pathologist networks. Secondly, um, you know, pathology uh, is, um, you know, most of the labs are not really equipped with digital pathology equipment, uh, actually including a lot of the 3A hospitals. And, um, you know, most university affiliated hospitals do have digital pathology in research labs, more for research and education purposes. But nearly all the pathology labs are capable of processing basic sort of AG slides effectively. But the lower level hospitals, including the 3B and C and 2A level hospitals, may be challenged to use more specialized staining techniques, such as IHC. Uh, the majority of pathology labs are capable of processing and analyzing um, basic HE slides and 99% of the slides are read without the need for consultation of a second opinion. Um, it's just that if a second opinion is needed, say roughly in 1% of cases, uh, the majority of labs would leverage sort of informal networks to direct patients to other typically higher level hospitals. The uh, lower level hospitals may seek consultation from pathologists outside their institution and patients are recommended to seek second opinions and then they have to sort of borrow those slides or samples uh, which are physically sent or brought to a different pathology lab to get the second opinion. So telepathology provides a potential solution for the situation that we see in China and, and indeed across many other countries in Asia, um, where the telepathology system provides access to experts uh, around the world in terms of international telepathology or indeed sort of through domestic networks. Uh, and particularly beneficial for countries with big sort of underserved rural areas or where there's a significant shortage of pathologists. Uh, it's then not only uh, beneficial in terms of providing more capacity for diagnostic consultation, but also in terms of kind of continuing education and guidance on patient management. So we can sort of see uh, sort of international telepathology models, um, you know, particularly various US hospital groups have launched these um, approaches in the Chinese market over the last decade. Um, these could either be general purpose models whereby a hospital in uh, China could access kind of pathologists uh, throughout the US or indeed, um, you know, any pathologist that signed up. Uh, or it could be more of an exclusive network, a private label type network, whereby a hospital group in the US uh, signs up a deal with a hospital in China and they agree to kind of uh, exclusively work together uh, with regards to diagnostic services. Now, we, before we look at that a bit more, let's take a look at the kind of types of technologies that are being used. And over the past sort of decade, two decades or so, there's been quite an important shift in the types of technologies that are being used. Uh, there's a lot of different technologies, but we kind of focus on the three main ones. Um, first of all, the early systems, um, you know, could have relied quite heavily on more static or snapshot imaging platforms. So the systems kind of captured, stored, and forwarded galleries of digital images for remote diagnosis. And in order for these systems to be effective, the platform had to link the digital images with metadata such as patient identifiers and if necessary kind of relevant clinical laboratory and radiological information. Um, also in these kind of static systems, uh, it was very important that the individual who kind of selects the representative microscopic
fields at the sending site must possess kind of basic knowledge in order to determine kind of which region of interest needs to be imaged. Okay. Now the major advantage of this type of technology uh, was in its kind of relatively low startup cost and minimal equipment maintenance. Also the image files are relatively small and it's easier to manage and store. So particularly for kind of poorer countries, these are important factors. Uh, there are disadvantages, mostly around kind of sampling error, uh, limited fields of view and focus problems. And, you know, there were therefore more diagnostic accuracy issues compared to more dynamic telepathology systems. So that's kind of the second type of technology that, we, that we're looking at. So dynamic telepathology platforms kind of enable the pathologist to view the entire glass slide by remotely controlling motorized microscope functions. So including slide navigation and focusing on specific areas. So the pathology now, the pathologist is now fully in control. Um, and sort of in the 1990s, this method became very popular. Uh, the big disadvantage here is that these systems are very expensive and they require kind of proprietary hardware and software, both at the sending and the receiving site. And hence they lack sort of interoperability. Um, so we haven't really seen these systems used much in international settings, not only because uh, of the high cost, but also, um, you know, because the, 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 this, the imaging, the reading is done real time. Uh, often that's impractical when you're dealing with kind of time zones and also when you're dealing with countries that have limited sort of telecommunication infrastructure. So that brings us to the third technology, which is kind of whole slide image systems. Uh, these systems produce very large, high resolution digital images of the entire glass slide that can then be stored on web accessible service or in the cl cloud to be viewed over the internet. So WSI permits access to the entire slide or a set of slides at various magnifications. And, you know, the contemporary scanners can capture a one and a half by one and a half CM tissue at 20 X magnification in under one minute. So for international telepathology, this really facilitates scanning of large volumes of slides. And the primary disadvantage is again, that it's relatively expensive still. And also the image archiving demands can be quite large because the digital files uh, and image viewer compatibility, um, you know, is not as good as with the more straightforward file formats. Okay, so telepathology, uh, both sort of in an international setting and for domestic efforts, alike sort of facilitates the, uh, the remote access to specialists, uh, which in turn uh, results in better and often more efficient patient care. So successful telepathology practices are directly related to advances in computing technologies that I just described. Um, and one of the primary strengths offered by telepathology is the potential to you know, really improve operational efficiency. You know, it's much easier to move an image than it is to move a pathology, pathologist or to move a patient. So it eliminates kind of costly, uh, inefficient and time consuming process of having to manually transport uh, a glass slide by a third party courier or indeed by the patient themselves. And um, you know, if you look specifically at China, um, there's a regulation that kind of prohibits human tissues to be uh, uh, allowed to, to, to travel outside the country, making telepathology kind of the only means of obtaining a second opinion kind of in an international setting. So as I said before, over the last 10 years, we've seen various groups from the US um, set up uh, telepathology services in China. Uh, I think one of the first ones in 2011 was UPMC um, who struck a deal with KinMac Diagnostics, which is a large, uh, if not the largest independent medical diagnostic lab operator in China. 
So UPMC's Department of Pathology provides second opinions for, you know, kind of complicated pathology cases. Um, they're using the scanners that I just described, the high, the high, um, the high density scanners to produce uh, images of the glass slides and then store and transmit them electronically. And then KingMed receives the second opinions from the UPMC pathologist through a telepathology portal. So uh, obviously it provides access to expertise from the UPMC network and uh, <clears throat> kind of helping the patients, uh, King Matt's patients with, um, you know, accurate diagnosis for complex diseases. In turn, King Matt's pathologies based in China also have the opportunity to kind of train at UPMC's facilities in Pittsburgh as part of their ongoing medical education. So the opportunities for UPMC are kind of twofold. Um, you know, on the one hand, there is clearly, um, you know, kind of the use for clinical care, improved clinical care. And, um, you know, kind of the other opportunity is to, you know, kind of generate an, a sort of a revenue stream for referral cases to the labs back in the United States. So um, it's taken UPMC about two, two and a half years to break even on launching this service. Um, and this was sort of when they started handling around about a thousand cases per year. So the ramp up has been quite steady, you know, with, um, you know, less than a hundred cases in the first year to, um, you know, close to a thousand after two or three years or so. Okay, moving on and also moving up a bit faster given how much time we have left. Interesting study done in the Journal of Clinical Oncology last year, comparing the diagnostic accuracy and report integrity of Chinese pathologists uh, when comparing it against the US counterparts who were doing the second opinions, um, it showed that actually a very large number, in fact, 100% discrepancy in diagnosis between the two uh, sets of pathologists. Large number of cases had improper cancer classifications. Uh, there were several cases with uh, improper quality con control in immunostains rendering interpretation or inappropriate molecular tests being done. So it kind of shows that there is um, actually a huge value in doing these international telepathologies because uh, you get a, a different interpretation and different diagnosis. And um, yeah, it might help explain to some extent why you see such a big difference in the kind of cancer survival rate between the US and China. The five-year survival rate in China is only 40%, whereas in the US it's 70%. So part of that obviously is around kind of making sure you have the correct diagnosis. Um, okay, then if we move on, um, you know, we've looked so far predominantly at um, you know, international telepathology. Of course, ultimately that's not the solution for China or indeed for other countries in Asia. Um, you know, we need to find local solutions, but there are a number of issues in having sort of effective domestic telepathology networks. Uh, one is around kind of technical implementation. Uh, two, it's around the fact that even if you do telepathology, it doesn't necessarily reduce the burden of work. It's more merely a sort of a redistribution of work. And, um, you know, what's really needed is sort of structural fundamental solutions to ease the workload or to make the productivity of the pathologist, uh, you know, at a higher level. You know, another challenge is to figure out, you know, what's actually the, the right commercialization model. Uh, clearly with telepathology, you are looking at making some investments. Um, you are looking at, you know, leveraging kind of expert, expertise from, from experts. Um, so we have to find the right model whereby, you know, everyone's compensated appropriately. And again, because we're doing this sort of in a, in a low income environment, that can be challenging. And another challenge is just around, um, I'd say some cultural factors or collaboration inhibition. Uh, sometimes it's hard for kind of the medical institutions to kind of admit that they need help. 
Uh, and clearly that's quite a fundamental part of doing telepathology. You do need someone to reach out and say, you know, we're, we're not quite sure how to handle this particular case. And, um, you know, certainly I think in the China context that doesn't always happen sort of the, the willingness even of kind of higher tier professionals and in higher tier hospitals to go and reach out to their counterparts in other, other hospitals. So before we wrap up China, I think, um, you know, it's worthwhile to look at one dimension, which is, you know, very interesting, particularly from a China context, which is around, you know, applying AI or artificial intelligence into telepathology, particularly around kind of imaging and diagnostics. Um, there are actually a large number of Chinese players who are kind of really at the forefront of uh, bringing AI algorithms into kind of healthcare and also into the kind of imaging, medical imaging and diagnostic space. Um, kind of leading companies on this page here, uh, companies like AirDog, E2, Invervision, um, iFlyTech, you know, these are all kind of major players in this field. And, um, you know, there's some data here that suggests that, um, you know, Asia Pacific is sort of in the lead when it comes to investing in AI for the health tech space. Um, study done by Global Market Insights suggests that, um, you know, we're expecting to see, you know, north of 40% growth in terms of R&D expenditure um, in sort of China's um, healthcare AI market. Um, so we're, we expect to see multiple applications from image acquisition and processing to aided reporting to follow-up planning, data storage, et cetera. And um, yeah, it's the expectation would be that AI is gonna massively impact the radiologist's life. So there's uh, some other studies done predicting growth of about 40% or so in uh, medical imaging AI in China alone, reaching about two and a half billion US dollars by 2024. And, you know, kind of medical imaging AI is kind of amongst the first areas to kind of reach commercialization status in, in China. So image analysis software can serve as, um, you know, a basis to address challenges in expertise, um, reduce availability that manage, many Chinese hospitals are facing. So, um, you know, benefits could include um, you know, reproducibility and uh, confidence in the diagnostic process, minimizing hopefully the need for second opinions. And it can also reduce the amount of time spent on mundane tasks. And a great example would be, for instance, in ROI detection tool that enables a pathologist to quickly find and assess target regions of a sample. So, I mean, obviously these tools are useful around the world, but given China's kind of major workflow problems, you know, the benefits are really kind of amplified in, in markets like that. Okay, and that brings us to our next case study, which is on the telemedicine um, situation here in Singapore. I promised I would say a few words on that. So um, let, me, let me go through that right now. And again, I'll move a bit faster given that we are slowly running out of time. So um, yeah, telemedicine is uh, clearly used for uh, many applications, but particularly we see it as a kind of patient-centric application right now. Um, Typically, um, the process works whereby doctor and patients already have an established uh, rapport, uh, typically with the wider family, and um, you know, upfront, uh, typically full physical examinations have been done before um, you know the telemedicine sessions would commence. Um, doctors typically would diagnose, um, you know, the, with their full senses, you know, something that, that wouldn't necessarily be possible on uh, over a kind of a telecom line. Uh, the mindset of patients has changed quite tremendously during COVID-19. So the uptake of telemedicine has really accelerated in, in recent months. And I think we've seen that to be fair around the world. Now, if we look specifically at Singapore, 
Um, you know, actually a lot of players have kind of popped up. Uh, right now, 11 players have been registered with uh, the Ministry of Health. Uh, six of them are kind of available for regular patients to use for consultations. So those would be MH MHC, Care Plus, Doctor Anywhere, uh, MANA Doctor, Doctor World, White Coat, and SATA Com Health. Um, there's also a company called HiDoc, which is for seeing specialists instead of GPs. And um, you know, other companies of that set of 11 fall into different categories. So for example, uh, MyDoc is a company facing employee health benefit programs. So you can't really download it unless your employer paid for the service. So most of these apps started out with um, kind of a focus on GP practices. So more for uh, basic medical care, but now we're seeing uh, specialists also starting to use telemedicine. So for instance, the Singapore National Eye Center is using it for glaucoma patients. Uh, it can also benefit patients with anxiety or chronic conditions like hypertension. And um, another application we see is for people doing rehabilitation. They can use telemedicine at rehabilitation hospitals like here in Singapore, Alexander Hospital, and Changi General Hospital. So Changi General Hospital launched uh, services for uh, geriatric occupational th therapies, speech therapy, and physiotherapy. Uh, also, um, Alexander Hospital, which I mentioned before, they've launched a program called vCare, uh, initially launched in September, which is five patients. And over the, sh over the summer, it sort of shot up to about 133 patients already. Um, we're also seeing, um, you know, kind of uh, applications for kind of chronic conditions. So Lions Befrienders Service Association works with various public hospitals, uh, providing services to around about 6,000 senior citizens and um, you know, helping them with follow-up consultations for chronic conditions um, such as physiotherapy uh, services and, and so on. Okay, so a big factor of the growth in telemedicine here in Singapore has been kind of reimbursement for, for telemedicine consultations. So in April, the government announced that it will allow patients to tap into their kind of community health assist scheme program, uh, as well as into their Medistep savings to pay for video consultations for seven chronic conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, lipid disorders, as well as for mental health disorders like schizophrenia and anxiety. So from the public side, obviously this is a great help, which will facilitate more patients to go with um, telemedicine consultations. Uh, also in the private sector, we're seeing uh, private insurance such as AA Singapore announced that they will cover the cost of um, about 50,000 video medical consultations provided by one of the players, uh, White Coat, which I mentioned before. Um, and this is for all its sort of Health Shield Gold Max policy holders. And um, also more broadly in Asia, we see a program from AXA, for instance, uh, they've announced to offer kind of free teleconsultations to roughly six and a half million people um, to include uh, people in sort of underserved regions in rural areas. And, um, you know, they're, they're planning to extend the service beyond the existing pool of, 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 um, of their customers and to move it more broadly into the Southeast Asia region. Um, Part of their program from AXA is they have an alliance with Tencent Trusted Doctors. This is um, the largest kind of online medical service provider in China. And AXA provides kind of 24 seven access to teleconsultations through kind of a dedicated hotline. And, um, you know, both AXA customers and employees 
can use the, the technology for advice and support. So they have linked up about 450,000 professional medical doctors and psych psychologists. So again, this is more of a China focused application. And um, yeah, they have sort of dedicated helplines via chat and video and um, you know, using WeChat platforms, for instance. So back to Singapore, um, I think one of the key factors uh, that sort of helping the development of the industry here locally is kind of support, early support from the government. Um, you know, one of the things they did was to try and create sort of regulatory clarity early on. So beyond um, kind of reimbursement uh, announcements that, that were made earlier this year, uh, two years ago already the um, Ministry of Health um, launched a program called kind of Licensing Experimentation and Adaptation Program or LEAP. And it was really meant to be what they call kind of a regulatory sandbox to better understand kind of new innovative services by partnering early with, with industry. And um, yeah, so they work closely with um, a variety of kind of care and business models and, you know, trying to stretch the full gamut of providers to, you know, really understand the emerging landscape and, um, you know, provide early feedback and regulatory guidance um, to kind of stakeholders. Um, so one of the key initiatives is around kind of doctor-led uh, teleconsultation and mobile medicine uh, that provides sort of direct clinical care, uh, including triage, history taking, diagnosis, treatment, uh, and so on. So it's really that kind of leapfrog uh, future regulations that will become part of the Healthcare Services Act through this approach by early engagement with the industry uh, learning from, you know, various business models that are being put in place, you know, they can kind of guide uh, through things like ethical codes, ethical guidelines, uh, and also they've sort of launched the National Telemedicine Guideline to, to, to help the industry kind of from a regulatory perspective move forward. Okay, that sort of brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, so telemedicine in Asia, you know, what's, what's the outlook? Um, so clearly, um, you know, the players that we looked at in Singapore, the telemedicine companies, they are, um, you know, kind of starting very much from uh, a niche, I would say, uh, focused on kind of GP, uh, originally, a lot of these players, uh, particularly the, the Chinese ones, were merely kind of booking platforms. So already a very valuable service kind of bridging patients on the one hand with kind of physicians on the other hand and, and really taking a lot of the stress out of travel and waiting at the hospital side. Uh, but gradually, we think that a lot of these players will look to kind of expand their kind of service uh, portfolio, uh, their relevance in the market. So if it's merely a booking platform, you know, the economics clearly are, are very limited, you know, unless you have uh, the skill of some of the Chinese players and literally are, we're talking about hundreds of millions of patients. Um, but I think a lot of these companies will need to move up the value chain and add more valuable services into their portfolio. So the first step a lot of them are taking, it's to move from kind of booking to consultations, which is still kind of merely a hosting type service. You know, you kind of just provide the platform uh, whereby uh, the patient and the, and the physician can, can in engage. Um, I think the next step is to move from kind of more of a GP focused area into kind of specialist areas. So already, as I mentioned, we're seeing that in Singapore with, for instance, the, um, the, the National Eye Hospital doing that. And also we need to sort of move into more chronic disease area. So these are, you know, more serious illnesses and, you know, can also attract a, a better kind of fee, both from the uh, specialist, but in turn also from the platform providing service. You know, also we then need to think about kind of moving into kind of adjacent areas, for instance, 
um, you know, partnering with insurance companies, partnering with pharmacies. So we start to broaden the, the service area and kind of leverage over time the uh, customer base that's being built up. So, you know, again, providing perhaps value added services, um, preventative advice uh, for insurance companies, but also thinking about perhaps building in a, a kind of an online drug delivery capability by partnering with pharmacies. You know, ultimately we see that moving into kind of more lifestyle and preventative, preventative health type services. Uh, and then I think the big, the big transition will be to move into patient monitoring. Uh, that's really where uh, they need to start partnering with uh, parties that have kind of specific clinical expertise uh, could be around uh, cardiology, could be around, um, you know, kind of maternity expertise for prenatal um, uh, cases. So, you know, we're looking for these companies to then bring in the, the clinical expertise and the kind of dedicated um, applications and solutions to start getting involved in kind of patient monitoring. You know, ultimately the vision for a number of these players is around kind of building kind of big data databases, um, you know, really becoming the central repository for patient information and down the line um, being able to apply kind of AI machine learning um, algorithms and offer a kind of more personalized medicine. Uh, this seems a very far stretch when you when you look at the companies that are active now in Singapore. Uh, you know, a lot of these are kind of early stage startups. Um, you know, a lot of them haven't really moved beyond being able to, um, you know, kind of help with booking appointments or or doing kind of video chats. Um, but if you look at some of the Chinese players, you know, clearly this is what they're aiming for. Um, they kind of start with the vision and kind of work their way back. Um, so the best example is probably a company called iCarbonX, a uh, company founded by kind of former BGI, uh, Beijing Genome Institute uh, executives. Um, they're trying to combine genomics with other health factors, uh, metabolics, bacteria, lifestyle choices, and to be, you know, kind of form a digitalized form of life. So their ambition is to build a consumer facing AI platform and to be a one stop shop for all things health and wellness, you know, from skincare and nutrition um, to behavioral health and, and genetics analysis. Um, you know, ultimately, it's around being highly individualized um, through their data sets through um, biotechnology, through artificial intelligence. Um, you know, and I think they, they have, clearly the management team has the prior experience at BGI in, in building successful businesses. Um, they raised in 2016, a series A round of uh, 150 million US dollars. So in, in, in their first round, they basically kind of reach unicorn status, which is quite, uh, quite remarkable. Um, you know, let's see how, how they do. Um, I, I would predict that, you know, if there's any area uh, within the broader healthcare space where kind of Asian players have a chance to kind of take a lead in terms of uh, innovation, um, you know, it's probably in this area. Uh, you have huge populations, you have a very tech, savvy and, and digital savvy population that's quite accepting of, of new innovations uh, around digital technologies. And you also have a huge need in terms of, um, you know, kind of the traditional infrastructure being quite undeveloped and, uh, you know, enormous unmet needs, unmet needs that can be, um, you know, kind of resolved partially through technological innovations such as this. So that's it from for me. Uh, apologies again, I took much longer than I had anticipated. Uh, I think there might be a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, but if we run out of time, uh, feel free to reach out to me. My contact details are at the slide below. And I think we can also uh, capture them from the, um, the AZ bio website uh, and, 
as well as in the, the conference app. So thanks again for your attention and I look forward to staying in touch.